Hi right, guys, uh, I want to talk about the back and forth I do, where I'm at right now, and why it's not a bad thing, but it's definitely an obnoxious thing. So, especially with more complex things that haven't really been done again, it's hard to know what the best approach to take is. You know, if you're, say, part of a dev studio who makes websites for businesses, then especially if they're similar to businesses you've already made websites for, it's very easy to predict what the best way to tackle it is, how long it's going to take, all that stuff. There's nothing like Stringier. In fact, even though there are other text processing libraries, Stringier either targets different things. Uh, so, for example, the work SIL does is drastically different from uh, what Stringier is meant for, even though uh, they're both text processing libraries. Um, SILs deals much more with um, spoken languages, especially, uh, whereas Stringier is just sort of general text processing, but also includes like manipulation for creative writing and things like that. Um, it's not focusing on spoken languages. I mean, it, there's there's a component of it that does in a much more simplified way, but it's it's, it's really not addressing the same thing, you know? So, since there's nothing like it, it's really hard to know how best to structure the project, how long anything's going to take, what the best way to implement anything is, and so on. I, I, don't, I don't have the answer to those questions, and so that means there's a lot of back and forth. Now, I, I think it's important in that trying different approaches, seeing what works. Sometimes it's, okay, that's just flat out better. We're going to stick with that. Sometimes it's, eh, I'm not sure. And then you mull things over for a while and decide, eh, we're going to try something else. And maybe that thing works out or is a huge disaster and you roll back. And there's a lot of experimentation. Um, not much of this is actually involving the code itself, though. Uh, what I've been finding is good project architecture is immensely more difficult to get right than the code itself. So, yeah, that's the big thing I've been back and forth on. Um, you'd know, if you've been following this work, that Stringier started as a monorepo. And that's unsurprising, especially considering it just it started as literally just some very basic uh, extension methods. Why break it apart into separate projects? This had started to occur a little bit, but it was still a monorepo uh, when I added another project aside from the extension methods for the patterns engine and experimenting with that based off of some work that I had largely largely worked out but didn't quite have working uh, that I had done in Ida for uh, a similar idea, implementing a Snowball-style pattern matching engine, but not at all like Snowball did, um, but closer to how Snowball did it than how Regex or Parser Combinators or anything else like that does it. But then, numerous, numerous things have been added to Stringier since then. We'll skip the whole chronological history and jump straight to, well, I now have a linguistics component that is, again, more basic than anything SIL does. But it largely addresses some concerns I have with culture info and how that whole system works. Uh, allowing for a much higher degree of granularity in the languages allows easier supporting of obscure languages, things that don't necessarily have a culture identifier associated to them yet. Um, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have working computer. That it's bullshit. <laughs> so it, it's a system designed uh, around addressing that much more easily. Um, 
the intention was to have all like two upper, two lower, and two title case that everybody forgets about, but that's an important thing for some languages uh, to go through the uh, orthography, which is part of the linguistics component, instead of going through culture info, especially since culture info doesn't support the two title case part. But that matters. Any language with a digraph needs to support title casing, and there's plenty of languages that support digraphs. Some of them I can guarantee you've even heard of. So, <sighs> bizarre. It's very common scattered throughout different parts of Europe. Different parts. It's not even like it's specific to a language group. It's There's several different languages that use digraphs. Whatever. Very... You get some... It's weird. You get multinational companies that should know better because they've got departments all over that are disturbingly anglocentric in how they do the programming i don't know i don't get it meanwhile you've got this bumfuck from rural ass area you can't even really consider this the country because it's more like the backwoods that i'm in cares more about globalization than an actual international company that makes sense. Uh, but you've got other components as well, like the categories that I did for uh, far richer Unicode categorization than the Unicode categories enum. Uh, it's an actual um, class that can be derived and supports all sorts of complicated extensions. Um, considering it's an actual class, uh, you can have immensely more than just 32 or 64 uh, different categorizations. Um, and it is of itself derived from set, so set theory uh, and set algebra are applicable to it, which means you can freely compose through set algebra the categories, which is fantastically powerful. Um, you've got the encoders API, for which has been way faster and more efficient than the crap that Microsoft has produced. Um, like a third of the memory usage that it utilizes because it actually supports stream decoding and encoding because UTF is uh, stream encoding. This, why would you limit it to buffers when it literally does not have to be limited to buffers? It's dumb. The encoding was specifically designed so that you could constantly have access to that information so that you could decode on the fly or encode on the fly. You don't need to put that into a whole buffer. But, conveniently, it is very easy to adapt stream encoders and stream decoders to buffers. So I still provide the buffer encoding and decoding. It's just, it works on streams by default. It's way more efficient. It also means you don't have to buffer huge amounts of shit out of a stream as part of the encoding or decoding phase. You can buffer as part of an optimization. So you just removed a buffer in a way that actually speeds it up. I know that's weird. I promise that makes sense. There is such a thing as over buffering and it's bad. But, you know, this allows the, the one buffer to exist where it needs to, to provide the optimizations of read and writes. Um, and not just to support a feature that was implemented inadequately. That's never a reason to use a buffer. That's, that's bullshit. You, you, you need to implement things right. Um, Glyph didn't exist when I first started this. Now, I really don't know too many languages at all. I, I did discover that D actually supported this in its native library. Uh, implementation looked a little bit different than how I did it, but um, an actual type for working with uh, Unicode Graphene Clusters, um, which is fantastic. I've been going through and adapting everything to utilize that and to making sure that the approach is very efficient and so on. Because um, that matters. That's how people think they're working with the text, and that's, that's how you want to actually deal with it. Otherwise, you get all sorts of globalization issues, and that's one of the things that Stringer is trying to help prevent.
So, yeah. There's search functions and metric functions and the streams API because I realized I needed to completely redo the streams API because Microsoft's streams are broken. As in they did not test them adequately enough. And it wasn't even hard to find the area in which they were broken, but they just they're broken. They can't do something that they say they're supposed to do, and it's non-fixable because fixing it requires moving a buffer from one location to another, from one class into another, and you can't you can't actually fix it. Unfortunately, uh, due to some leaky abstractions, you cannot actually fix it. So the Microsoft streams just have to stay broken. That's terrible. So. Stringier streams, a replacement on that, along with a redesign of it, um, because there are conflations of abstractions that I'll get into in a more appropriate video. But stream refers to a specific concept, and I see it sometimes shifted to the wrong level of abstraction, to where streams kind of is on the same level of abstraction as a file, and that's not right files and streams are different and if you have them operating at the same level of abstraction then how are they any different at all why would you do that and so care was taken to make sure that it represents a stream and only a stream and that's the end of it that putting that into a file a level of abstraction would require a, a layer on top of it for it adding in the, the file specific stuff and you know appropriate abstractions why i was bringing up the architecture and then all of this is that architecture has been something i've been having a lot of back and forth on a lot of struggling on. like i said it started as a monorepo but it didn't develop that way i strongly favor modularity and I think that is something we should all strive for. Modularity is a good thing. Having things as discrete modules enables them to be more efficiently replaced. There's less coupling, so testing becomes generally far easier. Um, coupling in and of itself is not a testing problem, although it's very prone to introducing testing problems. Because code that is tightly coupled Tests tend to run through multiple pathways and get really good coverage. Uh, don't tightly couple your code just under the idea that you'll get good test coverage, though, because it is extremely error-prone. You need a lot of tooling to help you with that. However, you need a lot of help tooling to help you with the situation of high modularization. Now, I didn't break Stringier apart to the microservices level of modular. Uh, then we'd be talking about a single package and library for a single function, and that's a little insane. I don't think microservices are a good idea. I'm still trying to find somebody to convince me otherwise, but I've listened to quite a few conference talks on it now, probably about 20, and it's just consistently like, I can't see this ever being a good idea. And I'm somebody who thinks everything has a niche, and I don't think it can ever be a good idea. It's too far in the other direction. Um, things can be too monolithic, though, too. I don't think the monolith introduces as many problems as microservices do, though. But ideally, you have a good middle ground, a good modularization based on discrete concepts, not necessarily the smallest level that you could potentially separate, but just a conceptual boundary. And this is what I was doing with string here. I'd broken down each of those components that I'd mentioned into their own uh, modules, their own libraries, their own repos. Um, and I had built the entire thing up like that. The string here version 3 had been designed entirely like that. Now, what I had been noticing, however, especially during the V4 audit, is there were quite a few instances 
a lot of instances, actually. Quite a few downplays it. There, there were a lot of instances where code was being duplicated across projects for various reasons, and the duplication wasn't exactly orthogonal. Now, this is a problem commonly seen with microservices, and I didn't even hit microservice level and I was still hitting this problem. It's a strong indicator that you do not have things as granular as they could be. And I shouldn't say that. It may be an indicator that you do not have things as granular as it, that you could have them. And that should be the first thing that you start looking into. But the other possibility is that your logical boundary is wrong. And that's what it was in my case. Stringier actually needs to be tightly coupled because of how it works. That seems a little weird, but let's consider an example. I had, as a little aside, resurrected Collectathon, built that up to a level where it was satisfactory for use as a uh, collections framework and collections library um, for use with Stringier to simplify a lot of the code that I had been introducing because there was a growing number of data structures that were being implemented in Stringier and having a framework to build upon to make those easier to implement, easier to test, um, less code in general, um, was very helpful. One data structure you would like to implement is the rope. Ropes, for those unfamiliar, are a type of dynamic string. Um, it's complicated. It's not just a matter of like a dynamic resized array or a linked list. Although I see a lot of people claiming to implement ropes and doing it through linked lists. That's not a rope, guys. Rope refers to a very specific computer science concept. If you're going to do a linked list of strings, call it something else. But again, rope refers to a very specific computer science concept. But ropes, they have benefits. I'll, I'll talk about that another time. I don't need to get into that just for the sake of this. But you want to implement this data structure and have it usable throughout Stringier wherever it would be appropriate to use it. Now this means that... Oh Jesus. This means that the ropes need to be... I don't know, I can get to voicemail. The ropes need to be accessible to all the different functions that are implemented in Stringier. Those functions are in core, what's generally supposed to be the lowest major component. There are a bunch of minor components that are below it, but um, it's supposed to be the lowest major component. The structures, much like the other single type libraries, should probably be below core. Reason being so that you can you know, depend the core can depend on structures, and then you can um, utilize that the type, the, the rope type, and anything else that needs to be within core. Okay. Rope has to be implemented in part with some of the functions that are in core. This isn't the only case where this kind of coupling had happened. Something I wanted to do was to... Um, certain functions would make sense to have a patterns overload, much like how I was introducing categories overloads. So this is a quick example of a category overload, where, where a category makes sense as an overload, is a trim. Trim makes sense to pass in a, a character or a rune or a glyph and trim those. But it also makes sense to put in a category. So you want to trim all white space characters, ignoring the fact that the one without any par parameters at all does that, uh, just because it's an easy example. Um, 
it's Tremol punctuation or Tremol box characters. That would be another example where this actually makes sense and isn't provided by an overload. Do you want to list every single character that is there? That's a little less than ideal. How do you make sure that you have them all? Unit tests, but then everybody's got to duplicate their unit tests, and that means the library really isn't providing as much as it could be, because ideally you'd like to do something like that within the library. Okay. You can't. You really... Category pass the category in. The category does the check against every single character or rune or whatever it is iterating over, whatever that function needs to iterate over, uh, as long as it applies it. Does that for trim, it iterates over, oh, I believe rune. And so it would chop off all the runes that um, match that category. In the case of white sp trimming white space, it would clean off all the white space characters. Although that overload specifically, since there is no white space characters above the basic multilingual plane, what it actually does is iterate over the characters just because it's slightly faster, but that's implementation details. Um, they accomplish the same thing. String here tries to be a little clever at times. As long as the behavior is the same, the implementation can deviate a little bit uh, where, where appropriate. Where you can make certain assumptions, it makes those assumptions. But it, there are certain instances where a pattern would also be appropriate. Um, I don't know. I'm not looking through the source code right now. So, uh, so uh, one one example I can come up with off the top of my head is like a variant of ensure begins with or ensure ends with, where you give it a pattern along with a default, because once you have a pattern, you can't just attach that pattern as text. That's the that that doesn't make any sense. Um, but you can give it that pattern, and if it has you know, any of those, then it just returns the string as is. But if it doesn't, it attaches the default to it. Um, say something like the lineage designator. Senior, junior, the third, the fourth, the fifth. If it has any of those, don't add it. But if it doesn't have any of those, then the assumption is that it's senior, and you add senior. That kind of thing. It makes sense for some methods to be able to provide patterns overloads. So do you overload all of those functions and put them in the patterns library, even though the functions are supposed to be within core? If you do that, you have a circular dependency. But if you don't do that, then you're not actually segmenting on logical boundaries. So it's it's less than ideal. What it became clear is that, generally speaking, string here doesn't have these tight logical boundaries that I was trying to find. In fact, string overall is the logical boundary, with one exception. The rune backport, that can be its own thing. That can stay as its own library. The entire rest of string here has to all be merged back together. That is the appropriate architecture for it. I'm almost positive of that. Now, I've spent the last two days doing this, and what I have noticed is that when you start linking these back together, when you start putting them all within the same project, 
oh my God, the code gets a lot simpler. You can bypass a lot of the public APIs and go to internals. Now, that doesn't necessarily seem like a huge deal. And there are some of you that are going, oh my God, what the hell is wrong with you? But here's a fantastic example of one of these cases. Glyph type. The whole point of the glyph type is to as efficiently as possible represent a Unicode graphing cluster. Oftentimes, the Unicode graphing cluster can be directly uh, taken from a single character or rune. Going through the public constructors involves a whole validation check. No, I can't use that example anymore because it doesn't do that anymore. It actually just directly imports it. Never mind. But there are other, there are cases. Uh, the encoders, the public interface for the encoders, and there's a lot of encoding changes done throughout Stringier um, for various reasons. The encoder. The public API does validation. If you're encoding two surrogate halves into a single Unicode scalar value, it's going to make sure that the high surrogate is the, actually a high surrogate and that the low surrogate is actually a low surrogate. Um, and that's going to take that scalar value and construct a room from it. And as part of that, it's going to validate that the uh, scalar value that is which was returned back is an actual valid scalar value. Um, there is an internal unsafe version of this encoder that the public one calls uh, that doesn't do those checks because essentially it's the public API's job to do the checks and then just call the unsafe one. So if you're doing work otherwise and you know that you produced valid stuff for various reasons, whether it's some type of assertion that you can make or you've already just validated it why would you validate it again by passing it into the public one just pass it into the private one the, the internal unsafe one that's you don't need to check the same thing multiple times and it's faster if you don't So, you know, all of that modularity, flawed kind of modularity. Given the right kind of system, the right kind of architecture and everything, you can accomplish that. Uh, and in fact, a big part of why I constantly try to do that with my projects is that... Um, Actually, the way that Ida namespacing works through its packages enforces that that is possible, which is clever. But there are a few leaky problems. Uh, there's a certain exploit you can do because of an information leak that should not exist, and that exploit is problematic. <laughs> um, but the general idea about how to add a deals with that is actually fantastic and allows that higher degree of modularity, uh, which is then never utilized by any project that I've seen out there. And it's mind boggling why that's the case, because uh, you could actually build each package as a discrete shared library and swap them out freely because Ida has very strict rules on how that's done, unlike C++. So that's a much more feasible thing to do. That's fantastic. A good package manager would be able to exploit the living hell out of that to provide all kinds of special efficiencies, but it's just not, it's just not done. Yay. So, <sighs> Stringer has to be built as what is essentially a single mono repo, not including the root backport. is what it is.
but this is fine because the point of stringier is to be a large part of the runtime for Langley and then what Langley gets used to build. And those things can design modularity right into the language and address this problem a little better. So it's only a delayed problem. It'll go away in time. But for now, string here is just very tightly coupled. 